Hi, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the physiology of vision and a little more about how we see. So what we have are photoreceptors in our retina, and these photoreceptors respond to electromagnetic energy. Now, you don't have to memorize the wavelength, but anything between 400 and 700 nanometers, you can see it's a very narrow spectrum of all this electromagnetic radiation, basically, or um, wavelengths around us, anything from gamma waves to x-rays to radio waves. Now, we can't see those we can only see a small piece or a small slice of this electromagnetic energy now again you can see we have what we call Roy G Biv so we can kind of see our red orange yellow green these are the colors we get because remember we have the three colored cones we have the blue cones the green cones and the red cones and they overlap but first let's just review how we focus the image so the idea remember is that you have to get it right on that sweet spot on that phobia centralis and so the light comes in and this is really dependent on the window which was the cornea and also on that lens and so that lens remember can kind of change its shape a little bit to make sure that we focus light there when the lens changes shape, this is called accommodation. So our lens is best suited to look at things farther away. So when you look off into the distance, anything 20 feet and away, those ciliary muscles and ligaments just simply relax and your lens flattens out. And that's what our eyes are best for looking at. If we're looking up close, like I'm looking on this computer screen, then what happens is the lens has to actually bulge a little bit. Those muscles have to contract in order to make that light fit right on that phobia centralis. And so when you're doing any kind of close up work, anything within arm's distance, and your lens has to accommodate, that can produce more eye strain. You might get headaches, you might feel fatigued, and that's why it's important to kind of stop and look away periodically if you're doing work like that. Now, normal vision is called 2020 vision. And again, what I want you to notice is you have that like sweet spot, right? That phobia. And so as the light comes in through the cornea and the lens, it gets focused on the phobia and that gives us our best vision. And we call this vision 2020 vision. Now we have some conditions where it doesn't focus, the light doesn't focus where it should. So the first one's called myopia. And myopia means you're nearsighted. And nearsighted means you see fine up close but you can't see things far away. Now, notice what's happening in nearsighted is the image is focusing in front of the fovea. This is where it's supposed to be, back on the retina on the fovea, but it's actually up in front of it. And so what happens is we wear lenses and the lenses are going to force the light to hit where it's supposed to hit. And so that myopia is going to be corrected. So that's nearsighted. Now, farsighted on the other hand means that you can see far away really well, but you can't see as close near. And again, if we look at this, notice the eyeball is a little shortened and it's actually focusing behind the fovea. So we have a different type of lens and it moves that so that it focuses right on the fovea and that is corrected so you can see clearly. Now, by the way, nearsighted is probably a lot more common than farsighted and it tends to be genetic. As far as focusing, we have what's called presbyopia. And presbyopia is why I wear readers. Um, because what happens is when we look at things up close, remember our lens has to accommodate and bend. As we get older, our lens loses the ability to do that. And so this is when things that are within an arm's distance look blurry because you lose the ability for accommodation. And so you use reading glasses to help you see that. And astigmatism is an irregularity in the cornea or the lens. So remember that when the light comes in, it has to hit, right? It goes through the cornea and it has to go through the lens. So if there's any kind of like bump or rough spot on either of these, it kind of makes the image um, blurry. And so astigmatism, you can, might, hopefully you can see the difference here, corrected and uncorrected. It just makes it look a little bit blurry. And so usually this can be corrected with the laser surgeries as well, or also with your, your glasses or your contacts to fix that. So I mentioned 2020 vision and 2020 vision is are considered to be our normal vision. So it just, eye chart here, right? You've probably done the eye chart where you cover an eye, stand 20 feet away, and you see how many rows you can read. That's normal. Then notice all the different numbers here, 2070, 2040, 2030. And so basically what these numbers mean, um, if you have 20, first of all, 2200s in your notes. See this letter E? 
If you can't read the E, you are legally blind. So what that means, by the way, 20 and then you have a dash in 200, is that someone who's legally blind can only see an object at 20 feet away that someone with 20-20 vision can see 200 feet away. So they have only about a tenth of a vision of a normal visioned person. So obviously that's pretty significant. If you're 20, 40, then that means that you can only see clearly something at 20 feet that someone with 20, 20 vision could actually see 40 feet away. So the bigger the bottom number, the worse your vision. And then I wanted to mention scotoma. This should not look normal to you. Scotoma is like an irregular blind spot. It could be due, some people have them when they get a migraine. It could be from the macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetes mellitus. But what happens is there's an area in the retina that isn't functioning. And so you see this abnormal blind spot in your visual field. So let's come back to the photoreceptors now and talk about vision. So we mentioned that the rods, remember, are our night vision and our peripheral vision, and that the rods basically give us shades of gray and it's kind of fuzzy, whereas our cones give us our nice crisp color vision. They're found primarily in the fovea centralis, the sweet spot, and they have a higher threshold, right? They need more light to be activated. They're not activated in the dark. So basically to summarize here, because your book goes into a lot more details, we know we have the rods and the cones, they're going to form the nerve impulse, and there's a relay of information that they send. So once they form this nerve impulse, they send it to a bipolar cell. So here's your rods and your cones. They get activated by light, they're photoreceptors, and then they relay that to bipolar neurons. Notice we have our bipolar right, neurons for in our vision and also for smell. And they relay it to what are called ganglion cells, and it's the axons of the ganglion cells that form your optic nerve. Now, there's some other cells in here. We're not really going to focus on them, so don't worry. They basically help facilitate the communication between them. So how do the rods work? Very basically. The rods, you can see, have a pigment called rhodopsin, and rhodopsin is a visual pigment. They call it, it's like a purplish pigment. So when light hits this chemical, it changes a chemical reaction. So here's the rhodopsin. This thing gets broken off, right? And when the light hits, it changes its shape. And we're not going from cis to trans, just know it changes its shape and it once it changes its shape, we say that it's bleached. So the rods are actually bleached by the light hitting them. And when they're bleached, that's what triggers that nerve impulse. Now, if we look at this picture here, you can see a photon of light is hitting a rod. This is what they look like. And so it's a change from this trans configuration to assist. So it basically changes its shape. Now, you have to have enough of the pigment for this to work. So the pigment in here is, like I mentioned, is called a visual purple. And you might have noticed back here that you saw vitamin A. So your rods are made up, basically they use, they make this rhodopsin from vitamin A and beta carotene. This is in like carrots, orange, red types of food. And so that is a critical component of the rhodopsin. So you need to have your vitamin A. You gotta eat your carrots. You probably heard about that with night blindness because it actually forms the pigment, the rhodopsin. The light hits it, causes a chemical reaction, you get a nerve impulse. They have a very, very low threshold. You can look at stars that are, you know, galaxies millions of light years away, and you can still see them. And they respond the same way to all wavelengths because they're just bleached. So they're either bleached a lot or a little bit, and you're going to see shades of gray. So as I mentioned, the rhodopsin's made from vitamin A and beta carotene, and when it absorbs the light, it gets bleach. So this stuff has to be made all the time for you to see, because once it's bleached, once light hits it, you have to resynthesize it. So when light hits it, it bleaches it, and then it takes a little bit of time to remake it. So if you go into a dark room, right, you turn the lights off, when the lights are on, it's all bleached, you turn the lights off, you can't see it first. Think about going into a movie theater or at night turning your lights off. You can't see, it takes a little bit of time to resynthesize all that rhodopsin. Once you make more, then you can slowly start to see and you'll start to see shapes and shades of gray again. And that's just because it takes time to resynthesize it. 
Now it's not on the fovea. So remember, if you look directly at something at night, you won't see it. And I mentioned this previously, if you're looking at stars or something that's very dimly lit, you need your rods in order to see it. Well, your rods are not on the fovea, they're your peripheral vision. So you have to look slightly to the side and then you can suddenly see it. The cones are our best crisp vision. These are found on the fovea, fovea centralis, and the color is what's reflected back at you. So this looks purple because this ink is absorbing all light, but it's reflecting purple. Anything that looks white looks white because it's reflecting its white light around us. Black absorbs all light. Nothing is reflected. That's why it looks black. So we have our red, green, and blue cones, and they basically overlap in their spectra to give us all the different um, colors. So color blindness is typically a sex linked disease because it's on the X chromosome. So hopefully you see that number and you said 12, right? So it's a X linked disease. Males only get one X, females get two and it's recessive. So a male only gets one X. So if that X is the bad X. If it has the gene for color blindness, the male will be colorblind. The female on the other hand, let me see, that should be a little c because it's recessive, is going to get two x's. So if she gets one of the recessive colorblind genes, if she gets another normal gene for color vision, she will not be colorblind, but we'll say that she's a carrier. It usually spreads from mothers to sons. So I mentioned this relay a minute ago. Let's come back and look at our visual pathway. So we are going to have our photoreceptors respond to light and form a nerve impulse. They send that nerve impulse to the bipolar cells and they relay it to the ganglion cells. Now the cones, by the way, have a one to one to one relationship, which means that one cone, every cone gets its own bipolar cell and those bipolar cells have their own ganglion cells. If you're looking at the rods, usually you have multiple of the rods coming into their own bipolar cell, and then multiple bipolar cells go to a ganglion cell. And it just explains why it's more like diluted. It's not as crisp and clear vision where a cone is very clear. Now the axon from the ganglion cells, those axons leave, and that's how we get the optic nerve. Now remember, where the optic nerve meets the back of the retina, there are no photoreceptors, so that we all have a blind spot, right? Now, something interesting happens. Notice we have our eye fields here, and we have our left optic nerve and our right optic nerve, and then fibers crisscross at the optic chiasm. So notice that the medial view is going to cross over to the opposite side. And so they leave as optic tracts. So each optic tract has the lateral view of the same side. So the left optic tract has a lateral view of the left eye, but notice it has the medial view of the right eye. It's kind of interesting how they crisscross and cross over. So this is thought to be somewhat protective. So if you were to like have brain damage and lose part of your optic tract, you would still get about three quarters of your visual field because you could still get some information from the opposite eye. So these tracts are carrying information back. Now they're gonna go through the superior colliculi and they're gonna go to the thalamus. And then the thalamus, remember its job is to relay it ultimately to the occipital lobe. So don't worry too much about the superior colliculi at this point. We did mention them briefly. Remember like turning your head to a sudden stimulus or how you react to something visually. Um, but the occipital lobe is going to have the visual cortex and that's where it's all processed. Just realized my camera was doing something weird. So hopefully that's better. So the color is the ratio of the cones. Remember, they're going to overlap to give us all of our colors. And the focusing, as we said, is due to the cornea, right? The visible anterior 1-6, which is fixed. The lens, that's the one that can accommodate, right? It can change its shape for near vision or flatten out for our distant vision. And so they're critical for focusing. Now, as far as depth, we need two eyes for depth perception. So if you like cover one eye, it's really hard to see depth. So we need both eyes working together. And resolution is just how close together the receptors are, how um, they're spacing basically. And what's kind of interesting is that all the information actually comes into the brain 
upside down and the brain flips it right side up. In fact, it's kind of interesting with vision, most of what comes in is just dots, right? It's just information like pixels, and then the brain has to put it together and make a pattern out of it. That's why we have optical illusions, because the brain is trying to make sense about what it sees, and when it does that, it might not always be right, right? That's why I have optical illusion. So two quick things, an after image in, is if you stare at something, if you fatigue a cone. So if I fatigue, you know, like a, a black or a white or a green or a red or a blue, I'm going to see the opposite color. So this is a cool one where you stare at it and then you'll see the red, white, and blue of the American flag. And it's just kind of a fun thing to do to look at some of these after images. So the flag one is fun. There's this box after image that I'm going to try to show you now. I'm hoping the screen followed me. You'll see red, blue, green, and yellow, but I want you to stare at the little white square in the middle. And as you stare at it, try not to blink. But what you're doing is as you're staring, you're fatiguing your cone. So you're basically fatiguing the red, the blue, the green, and the yellow cone as you continue to stare at that little white square. And what happens is as you fatigue the cells, when you look away at something, usually you look at something white, then you'll notice an after image appear. So you're staring, and now if we go here and you stare at the screen, you should see an after image. In fact, I'm seeing it. I see like an aqua, yellow, and some purple colors. So it's kind of cool um, to do those, and there's a couple here. They're also posted um, in Blackboard. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention was the... Um, optic illusions or optical illusions they are quite interesting as well we had some for you guys to look at in lab and you can also just google them but remember they occur because the brain is trying to make sense of the environment and so it fills it in for what it thinks it should be so here's a couple for you to check out now one thing interesting is that once you see an optical illusion you can't unsee it and also kids don't see these because their brains aren't going to be the same. So in this image up here, you might see like a white candlestick holder or vase, or you might see two black faces kind of looking at each other. This one might appear to be moving. They're not moving. It's a static image, but your brain thinks it should be moving. So it makes it look like it's moving. And you've probably seen this one of the old lady or the young girl. So if you see the witch, you see her big nose right here and her mouth and her chin and there's some hair if you see the young woman then this is her little nose right here and then this is kind of like her jawline and there's a little necklace there so it's kind of cool and there's all sorts of fun ones online so this finishes our lecture on the physiology of vision